Galatians 5, we're going to talk about drunkenness this morning as a work of the flesh. I hope you all have sobered up from last night so that we can have this discussion. Uh, it helps if I turn this on. Uh, the next... Uh, work of the flesh that the apostle gives us is drunkenness. Galatians five nineteen to twenty one. The acts of the flesh are obvious: sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hate, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy. Drunkenness, orgies, and the like. Orgies really refers to carousings, drunken parties. We're not talking anything sexual there. We're talking uh, alcohol abuse uh, there as well. Uh, we'll talk about that probably in a couple of weeks. Uh, I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. The Greek term methe. Uh, is used only three times in the New Testament. It's quite common in classical Greek, uh, but yet only three times in the New Testament. Luke 21.34. I think this is an important usage of methe here in Luke 21.34. Be careful, or your hearts will be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and the anxieties of life. And that crap. Context. We're not talking second coming here. We're talking destruction of Jerusalem. And Jesus is giving his disciples signs about the coming of uh, that destruction of Jerusalem. The problem would be if you're drunk, could you watch for the signs of the second uh, of the coming of the destruction of Jerusalem? You, you couldn't get out of town, could you? Uh, his message in Luke 21, the, the Lord's message, is Jerusalem's going to be destroyed. We know it was in AD 70. Here are the signs of its coming. You know, when you see this, you know it, it's about to happen. And yeah, a lot of people misconstrue that to be the end of the world, but that, that's just totally taking that out of it. Um, it's not. Uh, you can't be on your guard. Uh, to watch for the Romans, you can't flee. I think the loop, the uh, to speak about the need of sobriety, the need to stay alert and not be drunk. Romans 13, 13. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual morality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. When do most people get drunk? At night. Uh, remember day of Pentecost, Acts 2. The charge against the apostles when they start speaking in tongues is what? They're drunk. Do you remember what Peter first stands up and says? It's only 9 o'clock in the morning. Alright, that, that's actually what how that translates, the hours and so forth. It's only 9 o'clock in the morning. We're not drunk. All right, People get drunk at night. Typically, that, that's not, as we all know, uh, when I was doing some Uber, I, I picked a woman up like at 9 in the morning and she was drunk as a skunk. Um, and proud of it, by the way. And um, it, it was interesting. And that's, that's as much as I'm going to say in mixed company and standing here being recorded. Uh, it was an interesting ride. 
Uh, <laughs> I'll just tell you the truth. It was. Um, Paul has made the point, can't live as people typically live in the night. N notice what he says here. You know, live as in the daytime. Not in carousing. Night activity. Typically, drunkenness, sexual morality, debauchery, ascension, jealousy, you know, a lot of nighttime activities. What we think of as nighttime activities grouped together. And Paul says, live as in the day. And then our text on Galatians 5, 21. Uh, drunkenness as a work of the flesh. Why is drunkenness a work of the flesh? If you're drunk, you don't have self-control. Don't have it. Uh, those who are given over to alcohol um, lose all sense of self and and right acting, and um, that is certainly a work of the flesh. Okay. I yes. Yes. I do believe the main thing is a personal back. Nothing good is going to happen in that situation. Nothing good whatsoever. Hey, Peggy's right. There is this umbrella of light being God. In Him is no darkness at all. 1 John uh, 1. Uh, darkness. Uh, that which is evil and wrong and, and from Satan. And we cannot live that way. We have to live in the light. And so we must live as of the day, not of the night. And that is certainly part of that imagery that Paul Paul makes. Uh, you know, and as, as I'm reading there, reading the text, where he talks about, you know, let's not live in the night. Yeah, I, I think we're talking darkness there. Um, but it's interesting to read some of those sins there and, and think about, well, those are typically, not always, but typically at night. You know what we think of? Night activities, if you will. And, um, what problem is drunk in the church? That's a strange question, isn't it? Because I don't think we have much experience with that. I don't. Maybe some of you do. Uh, Jimmy, that's where I'm coming from, and where I'm coming from, let, let's deal with that first. Um, it's a question we've asked about all the works of the flesh, more than, than anything else. Um, Paul is addressing children of God. He's addressing the church and warning them against drunkenness. And so... I don't think we need to pretend as though drunkenness is not an issue in the church. Um, it has not been a major issue in 25 years of experience I have. I, I just, I've not encountered it. Um, 
just have not seen it. And uh, I don't know whether you have or not uh, in the church. But um, I had a lady come to me once. Uh, his husband was a drug addict. So, you know, in a way I dealt with that, but nothing like um, alcohol abuse. Most of us who are at not be aware of this. Um, yes, I, I think you're right. A lot of us wouldn't know that was taking place in a family's life. Alright, here's the question that I was waiting on and looking forward to and I just couldn't wait to talk about. Does the Bible teach consuming alcohol is a sin? Nazarites had to abstain from wine. I think that says a lot that if you take this value abstain God didn't expect everybody else to abstain. Oh, don't get drunk with wine. Oh, don't get drunk with. That's exactly right. Water was not prevalent. Mm -hmm. There was certainly a great deal of fermentation. There was unfermented wine drank. Um, I think that was in very short supply. And we're going to talk about that. Um, I don't think, I, you know, in the early church, most of them were drinking alcohol. That's the way it was. Um, you know, the Jews, and I'll get a little ahead of myself here, a typical Jew, typical, they did not add anything to the, the grape juice trying to make it alcoholic. But, Palestine, sun, that, Sitting out, what's going to happen? It's going to get fermented. I mean, you ever been in a church with some grape juice that's been sitting around too long? I have. Uh, that stuff we have right now, I, I don't know what it is, but uh, it's nasty. Um, and of course, that doesn't matter. We, we all know that, but still. Um, but yeah, there, there was... Uh, alcohol consumption. Uh, and scripture says don't get drunk. It doesn't say not to have any. And I do think we have to draw that distinction. Um, I would compare it, quite frankly, uh, maybe to nuclear energy. You know, it has good positive qualities and negative qualities. Uh, and I think alcohol is the same way. Um, Alcohol is pictured two ways in Scripture. Okay? As a blessing from God. Alcohol is called a blessing from God in Scripture. You know, I can't change that. A little wine for my stomach's sake, we'll talk about that. Um, the Good Samaritan poured wine over the wounds. He didn't give it... Uh, to the Jewish man there to drink, but poured it over his wine, uh, his wounds. That's another case where it's used medicinally. Um, and 
there are there are texts which talk about wine being a blessing, and then you go a little while ways down and it's talking about it as a curse. And I think you have to keep that in perspective. Self control, that's where it comes that that's what it boils down to, brother. Um, um and and that's now, we're going to go through a lot of scriptures here. We're going to read many scriptures. Uh, for the most part, I just have the text up here, and we're going to look them up. Now, if you don't get them all written down, this whole lesson is on my website. Okay, so if you want the link, to go and be able to just have everything right there in front of you, you can let me know and I can get that to you. Um, so I've got a way for you to have all of this. Wine is seen as a blessing from God. God gave His people wine to enjoy. Look at Deuteronomy 7.13. Wine was a blessing for obedience. He will love you and bless you and increase your numbers. He will bless the fruit of your womb, the crops of your land, your grain, new wine, and olive oil, the calves of your herds and the lambs of your flocks and the land he sport your ancestors to give you. Um, Psalm 104, 14 and 15. Did someone read that for us? Psalm 104, 14, 15. Go ahead, brother. The wine makes man glad. It is a blessing from God. Proverbs 3. Someone read Proverbs 3, 9 and 10 for us. Okay, go go ahead. Ecclesiastes nine seven. Hard to get old. I can't see that with my glasses on. I can't see this with them off. Some of y'all know about getting old, right? Nine and seven. Go ahead, brother. Drink your wine with a joyful heart. Um, Ecclesiastes ten nineteen. The feast is made for laughter. Wine makes life merry, and money is the answer for everything. Uh, um, I'll mention that the elders at budget time. Um, no, uh, I 
I don't know. Why are you looking at me like that? That's uh, 9 7. 10 19. This is an interesting concept to me. In the Old Testament, yeah, I know it's Old Testament, um, but wine was used as a sacrifice to God. Now, if there was something inherently wrong with the wine, Itself, I, I don't see how it could have been used as a sacrifice to God. I, I, I just don't understand that. Um, look at Exodus 29 40. Go ahead, brother. So wine was used as a drink offering to God. I think there's another verse here. Yeah, Numbers 15, 4 to 10. Uh, same concept, same, just different uh, sacrifices where wine was used as sacrifice. We have already mentioned this, uh, but wine was used medicinally. Um, Luke 10.34, parable of the Good Samaritan where the Good Samaritan poured wine on the wounds of the injured Jew. And in 1 Timothy 5.23, use some wine for your sake. Qualifications of church leaders speak of addiction to wine, not the use of wine. And I, you know, I think that's important as you think of this. Um, 1 Timothy 3.3 3 of elders. Not given through drunkenness. Uh, deacons down in verse 8. Uh, in the same way, deacons are to be worthy of respect, sincere, not indulging in much wine, not pursuing dishonest gain. Uh, Titus 1 7 of elders again. Um, get the exact wording, it's a little different. First Timothy. I think this verse is important. Uh, since an overseer, bishop, um, episcopos, one who watches over, manages God's household, he must be blameless. What's it mean to be blameless? Paul tells us. Not overbearing, not quick-tempered, not given to drunkenness, not violent, not pursuing dishonest gain. So the reason he's not to be drunk is that he takes care of God's household. Um, and so, but again, it mentions not being given to wine. And then Jesus turned water to wine at a wedding. Um, 
if Jesus turned water to wine, you know, uh, I, I think that says something. Um, I somewhat hate to make this analogy. That the reason they couldn't be drunks is that they had to be able to manage the household of God. They had to be in control of their faculties so they could take care of what was taking place in the church. Um, I think so. The idea of a Nazarite giving himself totally to God and an elder giving himself totally to God to the work of the church. Um, the idea of a Nazarite totally giving himself to God. I, I, I hate this analogy, but it's the best that I can think of. Uh, and that would be the idea of Lent, you know, and giving something idea of Lent, being totally dedicated to God. Uh, you know, it's 40 days, wilderness and so forth, and I don't want to get into all of that. Um, but it is somewhat a modern day analogy, uh, if you will. I hate to use it because the overtones of it. Um, I was taught the time I was knee high to duck, and Peggy has informed me y'all say knee high to grasshopper, so I guess that's how I better put it. Um, I always heard knee. I've heard that uh, all my life. Knee high to duck. Did Jesus make grape juice? Didn't make wine. Um. And there has been much ink spilled. Uh, and brethren showing this was not wine. There was absolutely no alcohol in it. Um, this was grape juice. Um, I think it's undeniable that Jesus was at a wedding where people were drinking alcohol. Okay? I don't think you can deny that. Notice verse 10 of John 2. Mr. of the banquet said, Everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had two But you have served the best till now. What was the custom? Then you gave the cheap Um save the best uh, Jews do not add anything to their grape juice to make it ferment but on a ferment just sitting out Stein here I think it's something important okay here's how the his yo of wine to water Okay, so you divide it into four parts. One fourth is wine. Sometimes they did, I'm told. Uh, now, here is it would be very, very difficult. One scholar said, and I love this quote, It is possible to become intoxicated from wine mixed with three parts of water. One drink for long before it affected the mind. Um,
persuaded of that, personally. But in the custom of the day, they would not have gotten drunk from what Jesus made. Okay, that's just not how. And the alcohol content was not like I think that's another thing to point. So, yeah, it was used that way. Yes. Like what we know. New. You know, our water coming out of our taps when we were under the boiled water divide would have been cleaner than what they were drinking. I mean, I, I would imagine that would be the case. In all seriousness. And, uh, All right, I'm glad we got to this part after that part. I, I really didn't want to leave class uh, uh, talking about wine as a blessing of God and not get to the other part the Scripture says. Um, scripture strongly condemns an excess of wine. And you all know that, but it's good for us to be reminded uh, of what Scripture teaches. Nor acted a fool because he got drunk. No. First case of he knows his first man to get drunk, just first reported. Um, lay in his tent naked and all of that, as we know. Here, I believe, is one of the most important text about drunkenness and people being drunk. Leviticus 10, 8 to 11. Somebody have that? Uh, down to verse 11. Alright. Why is it, I, did I say this one of the more important texts about drunkenness? Because of the context. I believe very firmly Nadab and Abihu were drunk when they went in and offered strange fire. That's the context here. Nadab and Abihu have just gone in, offered the strange fire, fires come out from the presence of the Lord, devoured them, they died there in the presence of the Lord. God calls Moses, I'm sorry, Moses calls Aaron, Eleazar, Phinehas, the remaining sons of Aaron, and calls them, oh, mourn, God will kill you if you do, and then he says this. And notice specifically what God says. He says, don't drink wine, permit a drink, whenever you go in the tent of meeting, or you will die, the last in ordinance. Why will you die? Because, verse 10, so that you can distinguish between the holy and the common. What did Nadab and Abihu fail to do? That very thing, right? They failed to distinguish between the holy and the common. Between the unclean and the clean. So, it's strange that soon as Nadab and Abihu are buried, they're buried right before this. That as soon as they're buried, God has Moses call Aaron, Eleazar, and Phinehas and says, don't drink wine when you go in there and, and offer sacrifices. You know, it just doesn't make sense to me, at least, unless they have to you were drunk. I, I think the context strongly indicates that they were. Um, and I think that says a lot about drunkenness. They didn't know what they were doing. 
It's not, you know, I don't know that it was the case that Nadab and Abihu just didn't care and just disregarded God's command. Instead, they go in drunk and they can't tell what they're doing. And they offer the strange fire. Fire comes from the presence of the Lord, devours them, and they die. I think that's why they offer the strange fire. Context strongly seems to indicate that to be uh, the case. Proverbs 20, verse 1. Wine is a mocker and be stray by them. And again, not whoever drinks them is unwise, but whoever is led astray by them is not wise. As we talked about the first part, that wine is a blessing from God. Yeah, wine is a mocker and beer a brawler. Whoever is led astray by them is not wise. I assume the same way we do now. Would be my guess. Uh, that's not something I've, I've researched, to be honest. But I, I imagine the process would have been the same, in essence. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, a strong drink is another translation. Uh of that. What translation you have in it? What translation you have? New King James or New American Standard. Um, Proverbs twenty three is important. Whenever you think of twenty right bruises, those who linger long over wine who go to sample bowls of mixed wine. Do not gaze at wine when it's red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it goes down smoothly. In the end, it bites like a snake and poisons like a viper. Your eyes will see strange sights, and your mind will imagine confusing things. Do be like one sleeping on the high seas, lying on top of the rigging. They hit me, you will say, but I'm not hurt. They beat me, but I don't feel it. When will I wake up so I can find another drink? The end there kind of sounds like alcoholism to me, uh, to be honest. Yes, I think so. Uh, that's a good point. Uh, there, there were a typical Jew in the day at the time of Jesus didn't add a lot of stuff to it, but other people, yes, they did. And it was strong stuff. It may have been stronger than what we have. I mean, it was... Uh, and yeast and everything else. They, they, they knew how to do it. Okay. Um, and for the first half of our lesson... Notice verse thirty: Those who linger long over wine, I, I gotta, you know, I you got, I gotta be fair to scripture. Um, and then the test we examine the New Testament and drunk as work of the flesh. Oh, we, there's no prohibition on drinking alcohol, but you gotta be careful. Uh, and. That's what Scripture teaches, and we've talked about that uh, almost ad nauseum this morning. Uh, any other questions or comments? Um, uh, 
Alrighty. Thank you very much.